Great. So this is the Florida Horticulture for Health Network's networking forum with the topic plant programming with seniors. Woo, that's a mouthful. Um, and moderating it is Mikel Lawless. I'm Leslie Fleming. Donna Prez Lagones is helping with tech support. And what we are hoping is that this recording may become a webinar that would be put on the Florida Horticulture for Health Network's YouTube channel. And we will be term determining that after the fact. And in the past, we have got some fabulous ideas through networking forums from which we've written an article, which we have published in the network's e-publication Cultivate. So we're hoping that we may be able to do that. Now, I'm gonna suggest that you keep your video on. And the reason I'm suggesting that is to facilitate networking and engagement. I see many of you don't have your video on and uh, we recognize that some people may have video challenges or internet challenges. So it's really your preference. Certainly if you don't want to be recorded, you know, I would suggest you keep your video off, but hey, don't we think it's nice to see one another? Yeah, and part of what we're trying to do through these networking forums is get to know one another. After the fact, we usually ask uh, in a separate email if we can share emails um, because you may like some ideas that certain people are providing. So that's something that we will follow up with as well. Okay, so let's start. Um, I guess I get to do a few minutes sharing a few points that I think are important for this topic, plant programming with seniors. And I guess we can, um, Donna, maybe take down this screen if you don't mind. So one of the things we're doing in this forum is to engage effectively with one another. And that's a key point when we're delivering any people plant programming. And in this case, we're talking about engaging with seniors. So we want to keep in mind that we will be working with people who have a range of abilities, they have a range of health goals. We're using different delivery sites and group sizes. And this could include any nature of different groups. And I think many of us probably have this type of experience, but just in case, let me do a quick refresh. So this could include wellness groups. That could be like a garden club or master gardener group that we may be delivering programs to. It could be active aging individuals who are physically and cognitively very alert. We may be delivering programs at assisted living facilities or to people living with dementia. It could be veterans or any combination of this grouping of seniors. So many times we in fact deliver activities to people with similar cognitive and physical abilities. And if you think of facilities, you know, a skilled nursing facility, people will have some health challenges different than seniors living in assisted living facility. So, you know, I think as we go through the activities, let's be mindful of that. We may be delivering activities at ALFs, at memory care facilities, perhaps adult day programs, but not always. And not always are the groups that we're working with similar characteristics or similar abilities. And we as leaders delivering people plant programs, whether we're horticultural therapists or other, we have to be attuned to that. So let's think um, in terms of plant activities delivered as recreation or treatment. And what I'm really referencing there is we want to think about therapeutic goals, although we may not always use them if it has a more recreational focus. So when we're talking about the different activities that we're going to share, what we want to think about is adapting the same activity. And these, this is what we would do depending on whether we're delivering it as recreation or treatment. And as we go through the activities, let's comment on this aspect. For example, if I'm doing a repotting a plant for dementia groups, I would have um, smaller or one-on-one -on -one groups. I would watch the materials very carefully. Um, I wouldn't be using sharp tools. I'd be keeping items out of reach. I wouldn't use toxic plants or soil or paints. And I would determine where the plants will live after the activity has complete, been completed. So these same issues may apply when we're doing the activity as a recreation focus session or whether we're delivering it at say an assisted living facility. 
the point I guess I'm trying to share is we need to know our clients and we need to have the capacity to adapt. Related to that, and the second point that I'd like to share because you know we want to get on to the real meat of this um, networking forum, which are the ideas, but we have to touch on safety. We have to know our clients. Oh, am I repeating myself? I guess I am. <laughs> uh, I had tech problems earlier. <laughs> Was that rude? <laughs> um, so we want to choose activities that are going to be safe. And here's the example that I'll give. If we're doing tasting activities, for example, we have to confirm the participants don't have allergy or swallowing or dietary conflicts. And we would confirm that with facility staff, with the individual as well, but sometimes we need that confirmed with facility staff as well. Again, when we're going through the ideas, comment on safety if your activity may pose some of these challenges. So I think we're ready to get started sharing some ideas for plant programming with seniors. And I'm gonna call on Mikkel Lawless, who I introduced, but I'm gonna repeat this because I'm inspired by the fact that Mikkel is a biophilic artist. She also is an elder care educator. So she is working with this population, has been working with this population and has a good understanding of therapeutic plant activities. So Mikkel, why don't you start us off and uh, then once you've shared your idea or if you have other points that you wanted to share at the beginning, what I'd like to do is a roll call. And uh, if you have an idea that you wanna share, please do that. If someone else has already shared your brilliant idea, just go, yeah, I like that idea and we'll move on. So Mikkel, are you ready to give us some of your brilliance and creative expression? Absolutely, thank you, Leslie. Um, so actually I'm going to give you an, um, an activity that I did five times in the last two days and it was very successful. So I'm gonna share my screen with you real quick. And Okay, so you yep, can see. Yep, we can see that. it, Look, looks okay. interesting. <laughs> so, to, so today we made bug hotels. Um, and this was such a wonderful activity. And so in the last two days, I have done this in a skilled nursing facility in assisted living and in memory care. And, you know, depending on your client, you use different ways to engage them. And I always find that really the best way that I engage my residents in the beginning is some kind of sensory experience. Um, especially as they're coming in. So I'll break out the pine cones and I'll let them, you know, feel the pine cones. I'll let them smell the pine cones. And in another lower functioning group, I also have a, um, a little speaker with me, a Bluetooth speaker, and I start with cricket sounds. Um, so I get them starting to think about insects. And it's really, not only is it just a great hands-on project for residents, but it's also, um, it really gets them thinking about the environment. And everyone at first is like, ooh, why are we talking about bugs? Um, and, you know, sharing information about why, why do people say save the bees? And why do we need all these pollinators? And it really gets them thinking about, uh, you know, our ecosystem. So it's, it starts great socialization skills between the residents. And they also, most of my classes were like, wow, I really learned so much today. They didn't know that um, only crickets, males chirp to get the female's attention or things like that. So I am very lucky because I have a very handy husband. So what he did for me was build these empty, um, kind of like an open birdhouse. And the whole point of a bug hotel is to have separate rooms. So what he did was he created an, um, we had some extra plywood, so he made some plywood. And I'm just gonna stop sharing here. Okay, so what I did was I went in with an empty, an empty one of these. Um, and safety, very important, um, to make sure it's all sanded down. 
because the residents, we don't want any splinters or anything like that. Also the bamboo, or I also use Japanese knotweed, which um, is in the bamboo family and it edible. So it's all safe plant materials, but um, each room specifies a different insect. So bees will come and come inside the um, hollowed bamboo and build nests, mason bees for the winter. And then there's pine cones and pine needles, twigs for the ladybugs and moss, oh, and bark for the spiders. So we talk about all of these insects and why they like what they like and how they're beneficial. So there's a lot of education in this as well. And I realize that not everybody has a wonderful husband as I do. So <laughs> I hope he's listening. Um, so another wonderful and simple um, idea is to use a milk container. And um, we all I did was um, cut out the top. And you still want to have your rooms. So what I did was you take corrugated cardboard and you just section it off. Um, and there will be no splinters in this, all safe materials. And um, okay. And uh, so really you could do the same thing. You can also do this with um, cans. And when I say cans, I always use the cans that pull off because if you're opening a can with a can opener, you have those sharp edges. Um, so I'm always careful about that. And if you do have anything sharp, you can always take some duct tape and um, go around. And then as far as, you know, I like having this being built for the community. So everybody's involved. They feel proud um, that they're contributing to their community and it gets put outside because most of my um, communities have little courtyards with gardens. So we pick a spot, we make sure it's south or southwest facing so that it gets sun in the winter time. Um, bees like to be kept warm and it should be hung up at least five feet above the ground. Um, and usually from a tree or it could be, um, it could be uh, put on a table, I guess. But also a really easy thing to do, just, you know, you can put a string right through the milk container as well to hold it up. And you can just wrap a string around the can as well um, to do that. And another fun thing that they all got to do was to name their bug hotel. So we had uh, the bees knees in, I had buggy days in. Uh, they had a lot of fun with that, a lot of laughing. Um, if someone saw a bug on the floor, it was the greatest thing in the world because they were coming into the bug hotel. And I mean, it's just, it's so cute, but it's, it also serves a purpose. And I told them that in the springtime, we'll visit it and see if, uh, you know, see what changes have happened, see if we have any visitors and things like that. So. Awesome. What a wonderful idea, Mikkel. Thanks for sharing. And thanks oh. for sharing some adaptations. One of the things that we're all concerned about is cost of materials and you mentioned the handyman aspect we don't all have the capacity to do that so I think hopefully from today's session we'll get some good tips and be able to modify super okay I'm going to call on Susan Morgan I see you're next on my list will you share an idea of plan activities with seniors Sure. Uh, thanks for that last idea. That was really creative. I love that. Um, so I'm Susan Morgan. Um, I have some things that uh, I've done, uh, delivered with groups in the past. Um, wearable art. Um, so here is a, um, it doesn't look very planty from the picture that I have showing here. Um, this is a activity that I did for Mardi Gras, but it could be for any kind of uh, celebration 
Um, and I just went to the dollar store and got these um, masks and we embellished them with pressed flowers and leaves from the garden. Uh, it could be purchased pressed flowers or ones that uh, we gathered from the garden. So it could be like a two-step activity in terms of going on a flower walk um, and pressing, uh, collecting things for pressing and then putting everything into the presses and then harvesting that out of the press later. Um, we used um, feathers and other kinds of things um, to embellish them. It's probably hard to tell in the picture there, but we had some, well, sorry. <laughs> um, we had some uh, fern leaves kind of blended in. So I loved the contrast of the textures of the, the feathers, which I got at the craft store, um, along with uh, plant material that uh, the textures kind of mimicked each other. So this was a great sensory experience um, activity as well, because you could incorporate all sorts of uh, additional materials um, in different ways. And I mentioned about wearable art. Um, so in addition to that, we made flower crowns. I get that um, uh, rustic wire, Oasis brand uh, rustic wire. You can get it from the floral uh, stores or the, the floral department in the craft store. And um, I just, you know, at night uh, make a uh, wire circles that just go around my head and then they can be adjusted through the wire. You can pinch and mold them to people's heads and um, then use, uh, I cut out two pieces of floral wire and we make little, two little bouquets. It could be one bouquet um, for more um, independent uh, participants. You could have it where they make a more elaborate type of uh, flower crown that goes on the head. Um, and wire those bouquets on. I like to do the two bouquets or one bouquet. You can't see it, I'm sorry. Um, can you see that? Yes. Um, yep. Okay. Perfect. And so um, wiring uh, those on to, and so how I do that is I make a little bouquet and then um, use the floral wire to kind of secure the bouquet together because it, it can be for uh, people with fine motor issues. Um, it can be frustrating to try to put the bouquet onto the crown um, if the, the plant materials are loose. And so I like to wire them together at, into the bouquet and then kind of lay them. So here's the the kind of the crown and then lay the bouquet where it's over overlapping with the wire and then taking another piece of wire and um, wiring it really secure on there. Not just a couple of loops, but you know, a few loops uh, around to make sure that it stays in place and, and giving it an extra pinch at the end so that um, there aren't any loose pieces of wire that are hanging down. Pipe cleaners could work for this as well. That's about the length of um, the wire that I use for attaching it onto the wire, the crown. I've done this for, a, you know, special holidays, uh, the Olympics, um, because uh, it kind of reminds you of, uh, I guess, with the Athens games, they had the, the crowns um, for that. I've actually done this, started doing this through uh, the Kentucky Derby. We were trying to get a little bit more creative for Mother's Day. It was about the same time as the Kentucky Derby. Um, and so it was an activity where we did that when I was there, the Kentucky Derby was coming up, but Mother's Day wasn't that far around the corner. So we may, we used it. I can't, might not be able to tell from the picture here, but we used baby's breath, status, and straw flower um, because those are uh, everlasting flowers. So they look great fresh, but they will dry and they will kind of hold their shape and color for a little bit longer. So I could extend that activity um, with that one last thing and then I'll move on, we can move on to the next person. When we did the crowns um, and the masks, um, I brought some mirrors for people to look in and it was really surprising the kind of responses. I wasn't sure how it was going to be, but I figured people would want to see what they looked like when they had their wearable um, on. And it was really interesting to see the the responses of um, delight that people could see themselves smiling back at themselves in the mirror. Um, and we also did a kind of an impromptu parade through the community. Um, I did this at a memory care facility where we had an impromptu parade and, um, you know, kind of uh, going along with the Mardi Gras theme. So uh, that's Susan, my contribution. Did you, 
Did you find the wearable art activities equally effective with memory um, care um, clients as with assisted living or wellness groups equally effective? Um, yes, actually, I, you know, we tried it out. I had a, a facility that was always game. I was there pretty frequently. And so we, I always would try out some of my new activities at this particular place. And that's where we, we ended up having the impromptu Mardi Gras parade. There was somebody in the group who was from, uh, New Orleans and was very familiar with the, uh, the whole festivities and, um, was actually sharing stories about, uh, previous times of going to the Mardi Gras parade. And a lot of people would have uh, some memories that they could share about that. And, um, you know, I, I haven't, you know, this was also, I think a great activity for women and men. Um, you know, some of the, some yeah. of the things that uh, came out, I think I had for one of these activities where a gentleman, instead of wanting to make a crown for himself, he made a boutonniere that he attached onto his lapel. Um, and, uh, I think he, I forget what the materials that we had, he was able to make his more into a patriotic kind of arrangement. Um, he was a veteran, a military veteran. And so he was able to adapt it to work to suit him. Um, right. and what he wanted Wonderful. To do. Well, you've given us about five extensions or adaptations of your activity. Thank you. That sounds like fun. And Susan, I just wanted to say real quick, um, that's interesting about the mirror afterwards because um, I've had residents with similar things that we've done or they've made necklaces or something. So I didn't have a mirror with me, but I did take a picture of them and then I would show them on my phone, um, kind of the same thing. But I, I think that's interesting because they don't always get to see themselves like that. So absolutely. Yeah. So you could do a selfie in that case too, where you can hold the phone and, and they can see themselves, you know, in real time, or you can take the photo and then show them the photo. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. And it's wonderful to use the photos, send them back to the facility and then they can post them. And I, I continue to be surprised of people who have cognitive deficits, how they really don't recognize themselves. But when we're delivering a fun activity like this with some beauty, beauty of plants, then it can be a positive experience whether they recognize themselves or not. Good. Okay, Fran, can I call on you? Will you tell us where you're from and do you have an idea to share? Not, there we go. I was having trouble unmuting. Uh, I'm from Wake County. I'm just starting, so I really don't have a great deal of experience or anything marvelous to share. Um, I'm here to really learn a lot from you guys, hopefully. Um, I've only, um, I've gone to a couple of assisted living uh, places with the master gardeners to do things that were plant related. Um, and the one thing that I did do when they were talking about berries um, was that I explained and then showed them dyes that I made from strawberries and blueberries and I had dyed some material and I kind of did it as a like a tie dye thing. I used rubber bands on it so it had a design on it. So it was really very simple, but it was visually pleasing and it kind of brought back there were a few people who had memories of actually dyeing clothes um, when they were little. So, um, but I'm afraid it wasn't <laughs> too good. No, that's, that's awesome. And I think the point, Fran, that I'd like to reiterate is we don't need to do really complicated activities. And I think that goes back to knowing our clients and knowing the amount of time that we work with. I think any activity that, for example, encourages people to reminisce and engage and participate is a positive. Um, the one point that I would share, and I'm sure as a master gardener, you know this, and probably we're all master gardeners too, is just some berries would not be safe to use, certainly with some populations, but I'm sure you did Strawberries that. and blueberries is all I use. <laughs> yeah, super. Okay, I'm writing that down. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Okay, um, Betty, do you want to go next? Tell us where you're from and do you have some ideas to share? Uh, I didn't know I'd be called on, but I guess I can do this. Um, I live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, okay. and um, it's not too unusual, but one of my favorite things is to do um, lavender sachets. And because I'm working with um, uh, more um, 
I'll say higher level um, cognitive uh, folks. Um, one of the things that I like to do is talk to them about um, what's the science. And somebody said something about reminiscing. Um, the science of um, smell is so fascinating and there are um, a lot of connections. And actually it's a neurological connection we have between our sense of smell and memories. So I think that's something that's really important. Um, I would start the activity by giving them samples of different things and have them just explore them. And they'd all have in common something significant in terms of their sense of smell. It might be something from nature, it might be um, a flower, it might be um, a spice or herb, you know, and ask the group, what is, what is about these, that, you know, what is it that they have in common? Not only um, are they of nature, um, but um, they, they have distinguishing smells. And so I'm working actually um, with Hospice of Central Pennsylvania with people whose spouses have died in the last year or two. And we talk a lot about reminiscence and honoring that uh, th those people that have died and about relationships. So it's kind of a support group uh, through hospice slash horticulture um, group. So it's, uh, it, it's certainly different. And yeah, I, just started, I just started in the spring and I'm expecting in the fall to um, to continue. It was to be planned for spring of 2020 and we know what happened there. So I'm looking forward to continuing the work. And I saw the other thing I would say is um, this program attracts people who have um, is an interest already in plants and gardening. And I must say, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, sometimes you go in and you think you're going to teach something or you're going to have other people share what you know, and then you end up just getting so much back, you know, people's memories, people's techniques for gardening, people talking about their love of gardening that's um, familial, you know, they first experience something through their mother or grandmother or neighbor. So, um, and that's what keeps us engaged as therapists or I think it does. leaders and people I think it programming does, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I'm going to just reiterate your point about relationships. When we're thinking about therapeutic goals, we think about um, physical activation or sense of smell, which mm -hmm. you've also touched on. But I think that a therapeutic goal is also maintaining or examining or strengthening relationships. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and we can do that in so many different ways. So I think that mm -hmm. was very interesting that you raised that point. Thank you. Well, and, and all of my um, programs really are centered around um, lessons we learn from nature, whether it's control and la or lack of control, maintaining ourselves and maintaining plants, um, you know, those kinds of things. So I, I just think nature does teach us a lot when we observe. It certainly does. We're like-minded group in that regard. Yes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing Leslie, that. Before we move on real quick, um, Betty, I, I love that. That's wonderful. And I love what you do. I just wanted to ask, how, how do you guys meet as a group? Are you, um, and how do the members become part of the group through your program? Uh, actually, um, it's been kind of interesting. They originally advertised through the hospice uh, newsletter and we didn't have many people sign up. And I observed that um, they're not, they weren't reaching out to the community. So just today, um, I took a copy of um, the little a clip in the newsletter that explained the program and took them around to some of the local churches because I was thinking, where would I find people that would find this interesting? So we'll see how it goes, but it's um, certainly voluntary and it's, again, it's uh, funded by hospice. So we have great expectations. And I should say, when I presented this to the director of services, for families. They observed that they had um, a book club, they have lunches, they have discussion groups, they have um, individual therapy, uh, and they were most excited about doing this because it's a little different. And it's kind of a backdoor way of doing some therapeutic things um, in terms of social services. Yeah, awesome. And yeah. Does, um, is this a, a facility in a facility or it, it's actually no it's actually in um this sounds terribly um uninteresting which i thought it would be at at first but it's in a social hall of a church 
And um, I try to make as interesting as, as possible and have plants there. Um, actually, as they enter, I try to um, play some music that's kind of relaxing and, and get people into that zone. Uh, there are some other uh, facilities around. We have a wonderful wildlife um, preserve. And by the way, I think I saw Mikkel a couple of days ago, so it's good to see you again. Um, but we we are now, you know, just in the very un, uh, uninteresting um, social hall. I, if I had more um, sessions, and actually I had five last time, I wanted six for every group. And um, hospice said they thought four was better because people, uh, in that time of their life may not want to be obligated for a lot of um, you know, a lot of weeks. But if I had more time, I really would want to take them to um, a natural and nature setting. And we have some opportunities around here, but we haven't done that yet. So all great ideas and looking to the future. That's positive. Wonderful. Yes. Thank, Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Good. Okay, next on my screen, I see Daniela Silva Rodriguez. Can I call on you? Do you have an idea to share with us on plant programs with seniors? Hi, Leslie. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a couple of ideas we've done, we've offered. For example, we've done um, hand scrub with coarse salt, with um, coconut oil and um, lavender flowers. Mm -hmm. And that was really, really nice, very um, sensory, for sensory stimulation. And they always enjoy, especially after working with plants, no? having a hand scrub is really nice. And you can keep it in the refrigerator without um, problem, um, without any problem. And the other one is, uh, we like to give them uh, basil seeds, mm -hmm. put them in their hand uh, and put a um, couple of drops of water and the, the seeds will absorb the water and produce a gel and they will rub it and smell the, the, the basil mm -hmm. smell and then they will sow the seeds. And that has been also a great idea a great activity and then of course they will follow up the, the germination process and take and nurture the, their own plant. No? So those are really nice ideas and also doing popuri, which has, I always um, uh, offer no? with different kinds of dried uh, flowers, uh, aromatic flowers and cinnamon and I know, whatever you want to put, uh, rose petals. And so I can share those ideas. Wonderful. Do you find there is ever a safety issue with people putting some of the materials in their mouths? Probably more with people living with dementia. Have you had any problems with that? No, no. We've offered these activities at the residential um, place here in Lima. Um, and we we've, we haven't had any issues, any safety issues, no? Good, that's great. And for the rest of us, if we are working with people with some cognitive decline, that may be an issue. I know some facilities mm -hmm. do not allow essential oils in mm -hmm. um, because, well, issues have occurred. So mm -hmm. it's always good to check with the facility. But yeah, you know, a common theme that we're hearing in each of these activities is how important sensory stimulation is. And we're using them as opening warm-up activities. They're part of the main activity that we're delivering. And we're using all of the senses, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Super. Thank you, Daniela, for sharing. And we know you're from Lima. I forgot to ask you that. So yes. thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Good. Good. OK, so Jan, I see you on my roll call. Would you be able to share some ideas? We know you're an HT practitioner, so I'm thinking you probably have a lot of good ideas. Sure, Leslie. Now, in the spirit of full disclosure, I don't currently work specifically with seniors. The seniors that I see are coming through the inpatient rehabilitation program at a local hospital. And normally they may be dealing with recovery from stroke, spinal cord, or traumatic brain injury. 
but um, I did want to share one. And um, we make a big deal of the change of seasons. So this is um, a votive with the tea light that we do um, for the winter solstice. Because a lot of times these individuals have been in the hospital for several weeks. They've been under fluorescent lights. I always want them to take something back to their room. And what I love is, um, I'm hoping I've gathered enough this year, using the pressed plant materials, the um, uh, Queen Anne's lace looking like snowflakes at that time. This is Cleome, or excuse me, yes, Cleome. We will talk about that from the standpoint of the language of flowers, and they always get a big kick out of it because Cleome means, um, would you marry me? Or more specifically, would you elope with me? And of course, in a hospital setting, elope means to take off. So we always have a good laugh, but um, it's an easy project. They love it because of course, with the days getting darker outside, they can put this on their windowsill um, in the evening around 5, 5.30, because we're in uh, Northern Virginia. Do you right? use Mod Podge for that? I do. We do lose Mod Podge. And you know what's lovely? If you use um, uh, some of the more the matte, uh, the streaks become part of it. You know, there's I always have a perfectionist in my group, especially with some of our older individuals. And uh, we make sure that they understand that the streaks are part of the design. So it's very forgiving. That's wonderful. Now, are there any restrictions on using candles in hospitals? Right, exactly. That's why, and we do make a joke about this. This is the battery operated tea light. Right. Because we'll say, you know, the hospital frowns on us giving you a real candle. Right. But, um, but, you know, they've become so much less expensive. They're pretty inexpensive. They will last for a while. And what we talk about with this, with the winter solstice, is looking forward. And every day getting slightly longer, either by seconds or ultimately by minutes, and how that relates to their healing, that, you know, it's not going to come quickly. It's going to be a steady progress and then not linear, you know, two steps forward, one step back. But we liken it to having that patience that will get us through because we know spring is coming and the days are getting longer. That's really interesting. I think passage of time is a very important issue working with senior populations. And again, we can um, translate that or use different ways, including plants or your votive, um, to work with people who, again, may have some cognitive deficits. But I think that's mm -hmm. really interesting. Um, one more question. What about the glass container? Is that an issue? No, it has not been an issue. I work with recreational therapists who regularly do ceramic work with them. Okay. So they're used to the potential for things breaking. Right. And but these way. are these are relatively sturdy. These are the Libby glasses. You can get them at Michaels or online. They're relatively inexpensive. And, you know, transporting them, I, knock on wood, I've never had anything break. Awesome. Well, and for those of us in this forum... If that is an issue, we can try and find plastic containers. Okay, and I'm going to ask Ms. Hodgepodge Specialist Susan Morgan, if you put enough hodgepodge on, do glass containers break less often? I've, I've never done an experiment. Sounds like we could do some kind of experiment on that. I was just going to say on, on that, I've done that with mason jars um, and skeletonized leaves, um, which ah. is a, a, a fun activity to do in the fall because that's when you start to see uh, a lot of that. Um, and also, I was thinking as you were talking about the, the plastic, uh, using um, instead of glass, um, using the plastic orbs they sell at the Dollar Tree that uh, I've done air plant activities. Uh, do you, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but it's like a I, circular I, sphere. Yeah, with the opening and then it has the hook at the top. I just purchased, yes. I just got them on sale for um, okay. air plants or a small thing to do in January. Awesome. Yes, 
Yes. And Jan, I'd like to thank you for sharing a different population of seniors, inpatient hospital patients. Um, that's a population that I don't think about as often. I haven't worked with them as much, although I just wrote a paper on U.S. hospitals and uh, horticulture for health activities. So mm. thank you for sharing that. And I'm just going to say this is why we have these forums, right? We've come up with no repeats of activities, different groups of seniors that we're working with, a lot of adaptations. Each one of us has shared an activity, but as we're talking or questions come forward, we are getting extensions, applications of these. So yeah, oh, I can just feel an article being written now. So Mikhail, I'm going to call on you. We're going to have to write this up and then send it around and make sure we have the right details. Absolutely. Okay, so I think I may be up next, and here's how I'm going to start. So my idea is one in a melon activity. Um, so what I do, and I've done this with all populations, not just seniors, is each person makes a paper art door hanger with the phrase one in a melon on a half circle of red, green, and black shaped watermelon slice. So the therapeutic goals that I integrate and these are gonna vary depending on the clients. Hand-eye coordination, hand dexterity, especially if they're able to cut out the shapes. Um, sensory stimulation, particularly if we're tasting watermelon. And I'm gonna point out again, that would be with pre-authorized permission, taking into account allergies, swallowing, or medications, um, if this is part of the session. I often will <laughs> encourage the people to lick the fruit first, not just to gobble it immediately. And that always brings a round of laughter and some interesting tongue movement. And sometimes we can jump right into the activity and it's not that we're stretching out our therapeutic plan activities, but we want to highlight different sensory stimulation and kind of slow down some moments that so that A, people can catch up or B, kind of think about and process what they're doing. So that licking and then eating the watermelon, which is often very juicy, is lots of fun. P.S. Some facilities will not allow therapists to bring food products in. So we work with the facilities requesting that ahead of time. And I've never had a problem with that. So um, we conclude this activity with the larger pre-made, this one, the one in a melon mask where the face shows through, and then I take photos. And of course, I ask for permission of the people and of the facility as well. Not every um, senior will have the ability to make that decision for themselves. And then I send the pictures back to the facility, either to give to the people or their families or to put it up at the facility. So this activity is good for intellectual stimulation too. It's good for humorous interactions. I actually have a watermelon costume that's probably 20 years old. Who knew when I made it when my children were young that I was going to wear it when I became a horticultural therapist, but I've gotten lots of use out of it. It's like a triangle slice, like a jumper. It's fabulous. Um, we like the therapeutic interventions, including following instructions, and this would be geared to what people are able to do. And even within a group setting, some people may be able to follow the instructions a little bit better than others. Now, adapting for dementia populations, and I mentioned a few of these smaller groups, um, sometimes I'll pre-cut the paper pieces. Sometimes I'll use tape instead of glue if I think putting the glue will be tempting um, for the participants. And then for seniors with strong cognitive function, I use templates. So tracing the different pieces would be part of the activity as is cutting it out. Um, I also can discuss a history of food, watermelon, growing. Do they grow wa watermelon in their communities? Is that part of their family life or their childhood? And then the nutrition of watermelon. I'm finding that I'm including nutrition as part of my people planned activities more and more, certainly as I become more educated. So that's my activity. Good. Okay. And Leslie, I just yeah. want to um, reiterate something that you said. I thought really important as a therapist is that sometimes 
residents do need to catch up. So you do need to slow down and you don't wanna necessarily draw it out or there's, you know, maybe, um, you know, one of the residents very unhappy and you kind of wanna divert the attention away. So before every class, whether I'm doing, you know, bugs or a certain fruit or herbs, I just also get a couple interesting facts. So I always have that in the back burner in case I need to direct attention away, let somebody catch up or, so I, I thought that was a really good point that you make is we need to be very adaptable in that situation. Yes, exactly. Thank you for sharing that, Mikkel. And, you know, some groups, some programs, some facilities, we know there will be agitation. And so I will often work with the staff beforehand. And if there is agitation or disruption, then we have in place kind of a way to either have a staff person engage one-on-one -on -one with the senior or remove them from the group if we can do that easily and certainly bring them back in. Now, I'd also add, if that's the case where they are removed from the group, I try really hard and this may exceed the amount of time that I'm being paid for, I'm gonna go and work one-on-one. -on -one. I may not be able to do the full activity. I may do the majority of the activity myself and leave the door hanging with them. But you know, those are adaptations and safety and disruption for the other participants. Good, okay, um, Cassandra, I see your name up. We don't see with video, but I think we can hear you. If you unmute yourself, would you like to share an activity with us? Okay, and Cassandra, your internet connection may not be too strong. You're muted. Okay, all right. And just if you come on, that's great. I think I've called, oh, Daniela Pres Lagonas, do you want to share an activity? You're, you don't just be our special tech person. Perhaps you have some creative ideas for us. Um, sure. I mean, I, I'm a student right now. I'm, I'm earning my uh, certificate in horticulture therapy. So there's definitely a lot that I'm learning from, from you all who are, you know, more experienced. Um, I mean, just off the top of my head, I was thinking of um, plant presses. I know, you know, similar to what Jan was doing, um, but perhaps with uh, clay or putty or something that would have like a very sensory type feel and, you know, it wouldn't be too messy or anything, or even with paint and, you know, um, portraits, making portraits of either themselves or families with leaf presses and a little abstract, I think, but it might be fun. Yeah, excellent. And um, I don't think all of the activities we do have to take that full hour. Sometimes we need activities for all populations that may be the warm up or the introductory activity, or maybe we're given like 20 minutes. One of the facilities, that's what they wanted me to do. They were rotating their residents through and it was 20 minutes. Did I like that as a therapist? Not really. You know, if I'm working with people and that's their attention span, okay. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to do that turnover of activities. That's where experience can really help. And I think the activities that have been presented today really are food for thought. So thank you, everybody. Um, I think we're ready to go into round two. Mikkel, do you have another activity you want to share? And we'll just kind of, I'm watching the time. We'll go through a few more. Sure. I love this activity. And I'm so glad I got a chance to do it. Um, because it's very fitting for this time of year. But if you can get your hands on some corn uh, stalks, you can make little corn husk dolls. Um, and I really love this craft because I always start with a story of the corn husk doll that you can find online. It's been a while, but um, I don't actually remember the story, but. You start off with a story and then everybody else has their interpretation of their own little story and they can all be different. Another thing, you can find the directions online, they're pretty simple um, and they are really inexpensive um, to make. And I think I ordered a whole big stack off of Amazon for like $7 or you can get them. And, and 
I like to order them because then they don't come with the bugs um, and they're, you know, they're clean and organic. But um, uh, one thing that I really love to do to spice this up a little bit is I'll take an herb. Um, you can do thyme or, or something and put it inside of the doll so that the doll will, uh, you know, have a sensory input to it. And the one thing that you do need to know is that if you are going to get them, you need about six, six of these per doll. And you, the, what you really need to do is soak them. You can't really do this without it. You soak them and then they're easily bendable. And just with some string, you could see how it goes. Rubber band string, you can make a little head. Um, but, you know, and then you can separate it for legs if you want to make a little guy. And this, this is really a great thing, like just like the potpourri or the sachets, to have something to hold sometimes. I have someone that has had this for so long and it's, you know, it's the little go-to thing that she likes to hold on to or something to have that she made that connects her to the earth. So sometimes having something natural like that by your side is really nice to hold on to. Yeah, and I think we would all agree that having the natural components or natural item is an extra check mark. That really is quite wonderful. Okay, and I would like to say, Mikkel, you get two check marks because you don't have a gender bias. You have a, a <laughs> corn husk doll in a skirt and a corn husk doll in pants. I think, Susan, you raised that issue. Oh, and they're beautiful as twosome. I think that could be a good activity as a fundraiser. And sometimes we do this. We'll make one for the participant and one that would then be sold in the gift shop or part of the fundraising activity or given to staff. So awesome. That's really cool. Good. Okay. Um, anybody else have another activity they want to share? Hey, nobody's jumping in. So how about I go next and you guys think a little bit more. Um, the next activity that I'd like to share, and it's a great idea, but I can't take credit for it. It is from Hank Bruce, who is a longtime HT practitioner. It's a flower shoe slash show. I should have had a prop for this. So, um, and I've used this for many populations, including people living with dementia, list ALFs, wellness, kids camps. It's a multi-session activity with painting or decorating shoes of all shapes and sizes. That's the first session. And then the second part of it is, and it can be done the same day, but usually, you know, as we're delivering programs, it's the next week or two weeks later, we repot a flower or a plant. Now I use small plastic bags as the container because they conform to the shape of the shoe. And uh, this can be oh so messy when we're trying to put soil into a zip bag. And so I typically use a cup, a plastic cup, or other, usually a plastic cup with the Ziploc bag in, and then you put the soil in, and then you can put the plant in. And then once you're ready to move it into the shoe, you can kind of modify it to fit the shape of the shoe. Sometimes you have to put newspaper in the toe of the shoe so the whole plant doesn't fall under. But um, I try to have a variety of flowers and plants to choose from. And so one of the therapeutic goals is the clients choose the plant that speaks to them. And this is a creative expression of each person. Um, one tip, please water carefully. I typically will do the watering or hand-on-hand -hand watering because the Ziploc bags are kind of flip floppy and uh, you know that be, can, can be kind of crazy. And then I like to, but this doesn't always occur, wrap up this two-part activity with a pre-planned flower show. So here's the play on words, flower shoe. And what I do, and I do this for the activity, I create a sign that says flower shoe. And then I put a stroke through the word shoe and write on show. Usually in sloppy handwriting, okay, I'm kind of sloppy anyway. I'm not an artist like some of you but that lends to kind of the fun, the play on words. 
and uh, then we would display them at the facility. Some facilities, they may decide that they want to sell these as a fundraiser again, but more often the creators want to keep this. They love having their name displayed beside their creative shoe activity, the flower show, and um, then they like taking them back to their rooms if that's appropriate. Of course, some senior populations that wouldn't be appropriate because soil may be put in mouths or whatever. But it is a nice way to kind of include creation and um, some of the other therapeutic goals that I think about when I'm doing this, um, creative expression, decorating the shoes and choosing the flower I've mentioned, cognitive sequencing practice, following the instructions. Another one is promoting sense of self and that relates to the shoes, the shoes that they choose. Woo, watch out. If you have baby shoes, there's a fisty fight over that one. Boots are kind of fun too, but you have to modify, you know, bringing the plant up to the right level. Um, social interactions, and that would be taking turns, choosing the shoes or the flowers, and then finished, fin showing the finished product. Oh my goodness, that was the longest show and tell that I've ever been involved in at one of my facilities. But you know what? It brought out humor and it really engaged one another because often when we deliver activities, the focus on the engagement is with the therapist and the individual, even though we're in group setting. So that's my um, second activity. Anybody maybe thought of something as we are taking a few more moments? I'm going to grab something. I'll be right back. I thought of a question. Um, like, as I said, I'm new. I know. Um, have you run into um, issues with, you know, with children? I have done um, the, the branches and you weave the yarn around it and then you take natural elements and you tuck them in. Do you have think that there would be issues with the sticks with the safety issue? The branches? Right. Does have anybody want to that? answer that? Anybody done an activity like that? Okay, I'm gonna answer. And my point is know your clients. So if you have a group who are gonna walk or run and stick people, and that would more often be in a memory care facility, that may be a problem. And again, you can do smaller group or one-on-one. -on -one. I think that activity would be fine. And I think that bringing in the natural elements, the sticks and maybe tying on a pine cone, I think that could be a lot of fun. And I like it because the material costs are gonna be low. Often when we're planning multi-session programs, you know, plants are pretty expensive unless we're propagating them ourselves. And so I try to balance out a more expensive activity with a less expensive activity. I try to have, you know, a plant gardening based activity. And I usually try to have something with a nutrition focus as well. So that's kind of how I balance and have that variety. Good. Um, now, uh, some, yeah. Can so I, uh, I, I, I missed the first part of that. I have dogs that like to bark a lot. Um, and uh, I, I, did a, I do an activity in the spring for Hanami, which is the cherry blossom viewing festival in Japan. Um, and we talk about the, the um, traditions that are associated with that, that festival. And it's kind of a, a way, if you want to, I haven't I haven't really had the right group to do this, to do forcing flowering branches where um, you get them where they're all butted out. You can purchase them at the florist or if you're lucky enough to have a flowering tree in your yard to harvest a few branches and to, to have people watch the unfolding of the, the, the branches opening up and blooming. Um, but when I've done this, I've done a flower arranging activity to kind of go along with the discussion about the Hanami Festival. And... Um, uh, I just cut the branches in that particular circumstance. I cut the branches. I've done this with, with memory care with um, a range of uh, functioning levels. And um, I just cut the branches so that they are manageable, that they're within scale within, uh, we use plastic bases with some of the groups, mason jars with uh, another of the group, uh, depending on um, 
the safety factors involved and uh, that the height of the cutting of the branches was uh, something that I really watched out for, but I didn't really have any issues with like people sword fighting or hitting somebody if that's um, that that I've worked with other groups where that might be something I would have to consider. I'm working with some school kids right now um, and uh, they were fighting with tall weeds so you never know how it's going to go. <laughs> right well and I think that's the value of us sharing these ideas but net net it comes down to you know who are we working with and sometimes those group dynamics get beyond us. I've had some very quiet you know, groups, and then I go in, and I they all had disrupted sleep, and woo, it's a totally different dynamic. Did the activity land the way I wanted it to? No, had I done it a month later, it probably would have been different. So, um, I've got a few other points that I'd like to share to highlight, and then maybe we'll kind of wrap this up. Um, I think the activities that we can do with seniors, and I'm using the word with, not for. We can ask seniors, depending on how we're working with them or the facilities, what types of activities they'd like to do. And one of the ones that we kind of touched on, but it wasn't a main activity, was going outside, walking in the garden, doing actual gardening tasks. And some of the seniors groups that we may be working with, that may be their preference. We've talked a lot about kind of hands-on tabletop activities and they're fabulous. That was the backbone of a lot of the programs that I delivered. But I think, again, we want to mix it up. Susan, you mentioned doing the walk around with the wearable art. If they're making the masks or the Kentucky Derby decorated hats, we can still have them walk around. If we can walk out into the garden, that's even better. But sometimes we can't do that for seasons or whatever. Um, I think we want to emphasize creativity. And we've certainly had a lot of creative ideas. We've mentioned reminiscing, and that's really important for this population. They like to talk about what they've done or the memories that they have. We want to encourage them to be as physically active as possible. And for some, that may be using their hands. Um, one of the activities I do is peeling vegetables at Thanksgiving. And sometimes we just hold the carrots or the peelers up. We just raise our hands up. Woo! we're peeling vegetables. We don't have to do that at the ALF anymore. So this is kind of fun. So, you know, we have to think it's kind of in degrees. Um, what about intergenerational activities? Some of the ideas presented today, like the corn husk dolls, wouldn't that be a fabulous activity doing with grandparents and grandchildren? I think, you know, sometimes that would be a lot of fun. And we've had some ideas relating to seasons or holidays decorating pumpkins, painting or filling bird feeders, which can be winter activities. And we have to have options for those not wanting to participate. Um, you know, I don't think any of the activities that we've talked about today have been overly complex. Maybe the bug hotels, that's a little bit more complex. And so we could have people working with staff or group members working one-on-one. -on -one. But we are always, always, always going to have some people who just don't want to participate. And to that, I would say, that's okay. Kind of like today. Sometimes we just want to be passive. Sometimes we just want to listen. And as leaders of these activities, we have to allow that. But we probably need in our box of supplies an option. If somebody doesn't want to taste watermelon or they have an allergy, what can they do in place of that? And what I would say to that is maybe just the licking motion, maybe not actually tasting the watermelon if I don't have another food item that they can do. And, you know, that can be fun too. So yeah, we're always thinking on our toes. Okay, um, get outside, ask how you can make activity more interesting. We've gotten a lot of good ideas. I mentioned the costume. I have a whole bag of hats. I had different aprons. That's how I arrived at the facility and the um, residents would look for what apron is Leslie wearing today? And I had enough that I could relate it to apple picking season or Christmas Santa in Florida. So, you know, those are easy things to do. Work with the facility to showcase the clients and their projects and tie into any themes 
or wishes that they may have. You know, the, we could talk about this, you know, for umpteen sessions, and maybe this is something that we want to think about moving forward. Do we want to have another session on these ideas? So if you are interested in that, let me know. I would like to know also, and I'll be contacting all of you through the Florida Network, do we want to share our email addresses? Because I think, you know, you may be connecting or you may be geographically close to other people. And that's what this networking forum is all about. I would like to suggest that uh, we put down on paper some of these great ideas and we will need some help in making sure we get your ideas well written which would then go on to be a published article. And so I will be contacting you in that regard. I don't think we can probably do an article with all of the ideas or certainly not in the detail that we've been able to talk about today. But I think this is another way that we can network. And in doing that, which we did with the last networking forum, um, Susan, you were the host, was it uh, seed activities? I think that was the topic. So um, in sending the article draft version around, then we got each other's email addresses. I asked for permission of that. So yeah, you know what? Let's keep sharing these ideas. We're trying to include some of them in the Florida Horticulture for Health Network's Chive Talking, which is the monthly e-blast that we're sending out to people who have subscribed, which I think all of you are, hence you got the link to this. We also have the quarterly e-publication Cultivate, and we try to include an activity in most of those issues. And uh, Susan Morgan is doing the Florida Network Facebook group, and that's a good way that we can share ideas as well. So, um, Mikkel, do you have any last words before we wrap this up? Um, I just, I think that this was so helpful, and I have to touch on your costumes because uh, that's so important. I have uh, ladybug wings and bee wings. And so I, they love it. They love it when you go in and you're dressed up. So like the different aprons and everything like that. Um, it just, it brings a smile to their face. And that is so important. So I love that. Well, you that too. And humor can be such an important method of engagement, mm -hmm. which is really what we are doing with this people plant programming. So I'm going to wrap up by saying thank you to everybody. Thank you for everyone being so creative and willing to share your ideas and have open discussion about safety and working with different types of seniors. Some of these discussions can be a little bit more challenging, but I think this type of forum allows us to share our expertise and hopefully inspire with some interesting activities. So. Thank you all, and hopefully you will be interested in participating upcoming.